Welcome to Love Your Family Again and Again and Again and Again, the podcast where we focus on parenting with love and clarity. I'm Dr. Marcy, a family culture expert who for over 20 years has been helping parents create a happy and strong family. And I'm here with Elizabeth. Welcome, welcome, welcome. How are you doing today? I'm good. Thank you, Marcy. How are you? I'm good. I'm very excited to be chatting with you because I know that you have a fabulous, wonderful family. We may have chatted many times about them before. In transparency, Elizabeth is a former client. So, but there's always more to talk about and work through. So for those wonderful humans listening who don't know about your amazing family, share who you are, what y'all, what all the moving pieces are. I am the mom of Angus, who is seven years old, and the stepmom of Imogene, who is 15 years old. I was raised in California by a big old messy immigrant family. My husband, Joel, was raised in England by a small old English family. So we have a lot of differences in terms of how we relate to the kids and help them. All in all, we're all about, you know, doing the work and that's us. <laughs> I love it. Finding a way to do things differently, but still in a way that is productive and positive because we're all different people, right? It's not about you and Joel doing the exact same thing every time and one of you feeling like it doesn't quite fit who you are, Joel doing it his way, you doing it your way, but both of the kids thriving. Yes. <laughs> yes. I'm I'm practicing really hard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that's, that's parenting. It's never just, I've got this and we keep going. Like, you know, once we learn how to ride a bike, we know how to do it. Parenting, I think, is always evolving and a process. And there will always be questions and wondering and refining as you grow, as your kids grow, as you grow as a family unit. It's never done. Totally. It's good to know that's, that's how it really is. <laughs> so I like that. that is how it really is. So what is one of your favorite things to do with your family? We love to, we like to go to a trampoline park. We love to go to Dave and Buster's. We love to go to a theme park. So we really enjoy being at places where we can ride rides or play games or, uh, you know, get stuff with tickets and do that all together. Um, uh, that's one of our favorite things at home. Uh, we watch a lot of TV. <laughs> and we like to play video games like Mario Kart. Um, we also like to play board games or we, Imogene, she's an artist and Angus does whatever she wants and does all the time. So he loves making art with her. And I we all kind of love drawing and stuff. So yeah, that's our jam. A huge range. I love it. From Mario Kart to art projects and everything in between. Yeah, it's usually get off your tablet, get off your tablet. But like when we're when when we make it there, when we make it as far, we end up being able to kind of well, let's do this fun thing together and get make a mess, you know. And I love a good mess. Yes, and the get off your tablet is is pretty normal in most families. Oh my god, it's the struggle is real, Marcy. Mm, which is why we talk about boundaries and limits and setting that up beforehand, right? When when you give your kids technology, saying you can watch one show. You can have it for a half hour. We're going to get off when dinner's ready. So the expectations are clear every step of the way. Yes. And one thing you taught me is that, you know, I set that boundary. We set the time timer. And when he's still, after the alarm has gone off or dinner is ready, I'm allowed to remove it from his hand and let him be upset. And, you know, it's okay. It's like, and I'm like, I understand. This was the boundary. Let's have dinner. And it kind of, it's funny because he'll get really upset, but then it, what's amazing is how it turns into like nothing happened. This, this, the minute he decides, okay, I'm not getting it back. And that's the clarity of it, right? And it's why I think it's okay when you have a five-year-old to take it out of your hand. Not a 15-year-old, but a five-year-old. She's bigger than me. <laughs> yeah, that's, that makes it harder. But it's also, it's a teaching process. When I say time is up to get off screens, this is what that looks like. And the more he learns that when mom or dad say screens are done, that they go off and go away, the easier it will be for him to one day say, oh yeah, and do it himself. 
But that's the process of all of learning of I'm told something, then I experience something. I'm told something, then I'm experiencing something. So for some people, it's like, you can't grab things away from kids. That's not nice. And they're right. That's not nice. But there is a teaching process for them to understand this is what it looks like to be done. That's necessary. Yeah. And that's the thing. When I realized that I was giving him mixed messages, when he would say five more minutes, and I'd be like, okay. For, for years, you know, I didn't follow through. And there are times when he actually is able to put it down. But I realized what was hindering that process and what led to the I have to remove this son was that I was giving him mixed messages. He just one more minute, just one minute. I'm like, oh, OK. You know, so no meant um, I just have to work this woman for five more minutes and I'll get what I want. No, didn't mean no. So <laughs> now I'm like, okay. I love that you knew you were giving him mix, mixed messages because that you as a parent, what we do as the grownups impacts what our kids do. And so if we're confusing, they're going to be confused. The problem is when we are confusing and we treat them as not listening or we treat them as misbehaving because that's not fair. You got clear. Now he can understand the boundaries and it's taking him some time to learn that because you were confusing for a long time. The longer we have a behavior, the harder it is to change. So now it's taking him some time to realize, oh, when she says it's done, it's really done. Okay. And he'll get on board and learn that, which is awesome. We don't teach our kids that. They can't follow the rules. <sighs> yes. Yes. So it's like I was learning. I was learning with him. And uh, so, yeah, that's where we're at. And um... Awesome. And that's the truth, that parents are learning alongside their kids. Right. I have made a career out of this. I've spent over 20 years working with families, studying how this works. What do kids do? How do we respond? How does behavior change? Parents, even if you have a 20 year old kid, you're still evolving with them. You're learning as you go. And that's hard. And the request or the requirement that you grow alongside your kid can be really hard. I'm a believer that we have to go first. We have to grow in order for them to grow. Totally. I agree with all of that. And what I wanted to ask you today was, how can I help the people who are caring for and teaching my kids at school, at camp, to enforce the same sort of boundaries that I'm working for and to work with him when they're not experienced with his reactions like I am? Like Angus can be very reactive when it comes to transitions, when he has an idea in his mind of what he wants to do, and that's not what is going to happen. How can I help advocate for him and support his caregivers and support his teachers um, while at the same time supporting him and myself as a parent and all of that, you know? Does that make sense? Yes, it's a great question. And it's one of the things that I think so many parents really struggle with. You know your kid. You know what helps him. You know what pushes his buttons. You know what's going to be hard. And then you have to entrust these other people, like sending him to school, sending him to camp, even sending him to like an after school class and say, I hope you understand who my child is, even though you're just meeting him for the first time and have no idea. And I've spent a lot of time figuring out exactly who my child is. And how do I get you to know that without feeling like an overbearing parent? Exactly. Exactly. Right. And it, and it has that tension. Yeah. It has that. Oh my gosh. Yeah. It's a lot. People assume because he does have ADHD, his reactions are not always cut and dry that, oh, you're spoiling him or, oh, he just needs a firm hand or whatever, you know? And it's like, no, he's not doing it on purpose. I'm just fraught with anxiety about caregivers, other parents. The judgment. Judgment, man. The judgment. The judgment. So the first thing is to remember is that every kid is unique. Right. And that there is not one, one size fits all parenting. There's not one size fits all education. There's not one size fits all perspective on what a child or an adult should be doing in any given situation. And that no kid and certainly for Angus, but for no child, do they want to be in trouble? No kid is purposely trying to create a bad situation and get themselves in trouble. Yeah. 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 Behavior is communication. So when kids are having challenging moments and bad behavior, they're communicating a need. Maybe they need attention. Maybe they need a break. Maybe they need help. There is something that they don't know how to tell you in another way. And that behavior is filling a need. Right. 
our job is to figure out what is that need and how to teach them to communicate and learn it better. So part of it is, can we get all the adults to understand that we'd be really better off? That when a child is having a tantrum, a meltdown, a big reaction, it's not to punish them. It's not to shame them for that response, but to say, wow, you're having some really big feelings. Something is happening for you. I wonder how I can help you right now, but I also wonder how can I teach you to have those feelings and not do this thing that none of us are enjoying? Like that's the big picture. So what do we do when it comes to school or camp or some other place where you're entrusting other adults? The biggest thing I can recommend to you is to boldly advocate for Angus, to be willing to be that parent who's going to say, I have a unique kid. Let me tell you about them and let me tell you what works for them. I think what's hard sometimes for schools or camps is to hear, my kid has ADHD, so please be kind. They they don't know how to translate that. They're like, okay, great. Now I, uh, 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 but if you say, here are five things that'll help my child. Here are five, here are five moments that are hard for them. And here is what you do in those moments. Now they may not take it, but if you just say, My kid has a really hard time with transitions and keeping his body still because he has HD. Thanks for taking care of him. Bye. If that's not their wheelhouse, they're like, well, thanks for the information. And now I'm at a loss. What do I do? But if you say, here's my kid, here's where they'll have a hard time, but here's how you can help them, right? So saying, you know, and I would write it out so that they not only does the administration or the leadership that you're handing this to know, but every teacher, every specialist, every Grown up that's going to come in, t- in touch with your kid will, can get that piece of paper. I'd make it easy for them to read. Put it in a chart. Transitions. What is the hard moment? Transitions. Give warnings. Stand next to him when you announce to the class what's happening. Give him a specific job of what to do while he's waiting in the transition, which I'm just going to say that again because that's one of my favorite things for kids, especially when transitioning in a classroom. There's so much downtime in a transition. The kids with a hard time transitioning don't know what to do. So what do they do in that moment? Count the number of kids in line. Check to make sure all the chairs are pushed in. Doesn't matter what the job is. Just give them something to do. Yes. Yeah, exactly. You know, you made a good point that they don't know. I don't think they have it in their budget to go through and train every teacher to be like, when you have a kid who, you know, is not awesome at listening the first time, here's what you do, you know. And also there's 30 kids in the class. So it's got to be hard for them. But I guess that's it. I guess it's having the, I don't know, nerve to say to them, guys, just in case this was an issue, I want you to know, you know, and and understand that. Because in the past, you actually did help me do that and they appreciated it. I want to be able to feel like I have the right to do that. Like, for example, I signed him up for a camp. Uh, Now I'm wondering, do I reach out to them first and say, hey, I wanted to introduce myself, tell you a little bit about Angus. This is who he is. This is how he reacts. Um, It would be great if I could maybe talk to his counselor and offer some support, something like that. Yes. Yeah? Yes. Because of the ratios in schools and in camps, they they cannot reach out to every parent and say, your kid's awesome. This went great. I wish they would and did. But when there is a problem, they have to reach out because of all of the, the ramifications of that. When the first interaction you as a parent have with a school or a camp is about a problem, everyone feels crappy. It feels hard. Yeah, exactly. Yes. (laughs) Because you as a parent, you're here with me on this podcast being willing to talk about it. But the camp or the school doesn't know that. They know they're calling a parent with a problem and they don't know what's going to happen. But if you start the conversation, if you open the door and you say, I know that there may be some tricky moments. Let me tell you about my kid and what helps them. Fully knowing that they're not going to follow everything that you told them to do because they can't, because of ratios and numbers and all of that, you are setting Angus up for success because hopefully they will remember a few of those tricks. Like I wouldn't give more than five five suggestions because you don't want to overwhelm them. And then if they remember two of them, you're still winning. Angus is still winning. But the other thing it does is when they have to call you because there was a challenge, You've already set the tone for that conversation. You've already set the tone that I'm a partner with you. We're going to do this together for the best interest of my child. I want to know what's happening because I want to find solutions, which also tells them, don't just call and complain about my kid. Don't just call and tell me there's a problem. 
Let's find the solution. And you want to be working with professionals who are in that mindset. And unfortunately, that's not always the case, but you're, you're leading the conversation. Right, right, right. And when it comes to your child, you always need to be the leader. Okay. Uh, okay. It sounds almost like sending that email is like a vetting process in a way to see how they respond if they're open and okay, if they're, if they're receptive to the information. Yes, because the, the alternative is that he goes somewhere that isn't open, that isn't willing to make accommodations. He gets labeled the bad kid, potentially gets kicked out, and everyone has a stressful summer. And if we can avoid that by cutting it off ahead of time and saying, this is who my kid is, this is what works, they're either going to say, all right, cool, like we, we can work with that, or, you know, we'll try our best and we're here. Or they're going to say, oh, no. Um, mm, <clears throat> and then you know you're dealing with people who are going to judge your child. Yes. <laughs> yes. And whether that's a parent on the playground or administration at a camp or the director of a school, that's not where you want your kid if you can help it. Yeah, that's true. It's, it's really easy to forget in those moments that there are other options, especially in New York, you know, because it's hard enough to remember to book, to do it on time to make sure he's all set up. But then should something like that happen, it's it's so easy to feel like, oh, God, this is it that, you know, it's hard to remember that. Wait a minute. There's other options. There's other places. And I think I like what you said about just being confident enough to stay on top of it and understand like, no, no, no I'm deciding this. I'm not thankful that anyone's taking him. I'm kind of looking for the right spot instead of. <laughs> and, I, and I also wonder, like at home, you know, in terms of talking to him about it, in terms of like we do talk about when you're in camp, it's really important your counselor's in charge and really important to cooperate. When something goes down, right, if there's an incident, I try to bring it up and sometimes like um, nothing happened. I don't want to talk about it. And he shuts down. An incident occurs. I want to be able to talk about it with him at home and hear what happened from him. But also I feel like I should reinforce somehow, OK, how do we do this differently? But when he shuts down like that, I'm not sure what to do because I'm like, did that make you feel horrible? Like, are you embarrassed? I don't really know sometimes what to do. Yeah. So to me, that sounds very, very human of him. When I have a bad moment, when I have an interaction with someone that is not who I want to be in the world, when I trip and fall, I don't want to sit around and talk about it. When somebody else decides they're like, let's talk about when you fell flat on your face crossing the sidewalk the other day. Nope. No, thank you. No, -uh, I'm, I'm not available for that. I got a thing to do. I got to go. Yes. Yes. That's all he's doing. We don't want people to come to us and say, remember when you messed up in that meeting? Remember when you forgot the words in that presentation you were doing? Nope. Don't want to talk about that. Thanks. Moving on. Like he's being human. He knows that it wasn't his most graceful moment. And he doesn't know how to do it differently. And whatever those feelings are, now it might be, he's a kid, he's totally forgot about it, he doesn't want to talk about it. It didn't register, which is also okay, right? It might just be, it didn't register. He's like, oh yeah, thing happened, whatever. Or it might be that he knows he should be doing better, but doesn't know how, or feels shame or knows he's different. Like we don't know what the thought is. And we can extrapolate all sorts of things. What we know is it doesn't feel good for the majority of people to be told they have to talk about their weakest moment at nauseam. So let's not do that to our kids. Let's just stop doing that. But we don't want to lose the teaching moment. And we don't want to just be like, oh, yeah, bad things happen. We're not going to we're going to ignore that. So a couple different ways to do that. One is when you know something happened at school, find a way to talk about it from a, a next time perspective. You know, I, I know that something happened on the playground today and you, you got in a scuffle with your friend. You know, next time you have a disagreement, what could we do? What would be better? What's a different choice you could make? So that you're, you're giving him the tools so that Angus knows next time, maybe I'll remember. And he might need many of those conversations. That's one option. Another option is to not talk about him at all. But if you know the scenario, say, oh, you know, I was in the grocery store. This person in front of me online kept being rude and bumping into me, and I didn't like it. It was really hard for me to keep my cool, but I kept taking my deep breaths, 
And I kept reminding myself that the line will move. And then I finally got to a place where I found my words and I said, excuse me, I don't like that you're bumping into me. Please stop. So parallel scenario, potentially, but you're talking about you, which makes it easier for him to participate. And you could say, you know, what would you do in that situation? How, how could I have done that better? Because I eventually started yelling at her and I just left the store without buying us groceries and we're ordering in tonight because of it. Right. You know, if you want to get real dramatic. but showing Angus that you lose your cool, not on him because he did something wrong, but just because you're human too, might open doors for him to be willing to talk about his stuff or at least learn the tools through your story. I really like that. Uh, I I actually love that. It's, it is. It's hard sometimes in the moment, especially physically, you know, he'll squeeze me or we're like, mommy, let me just touch your face. And, and in that moment, it feels impossible to teach him anything. I'm like, just stop, calm down. And it's like, I like the idea of being like, you know what happened? This person was felt a little rough when I, you know, just kind of give him an example outside because he does respond to stories and he does come home from school and talk about, oh, ma, today the class was so noisy. Our science teacher, duh, 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 you know, and he talks about how good he is at quiet lunch, quiet breakfast, you know, like, so I feel like that could be a really good approach for him because he does respond to uh, other people's <laughs> other people's <laughs> drama. He wants to feel successful. So he's telling you the moments he did well, and he's talking about hardships in a general way. Isn't that what feels better to all of us? So tell stories, talk about stories of here's, here's how we can do this better in that overarching way. Here's how people can do this better. When I'm feeling angry, I do this. When I'm feeling frustrated, I do that. So that he gets the concept and then remind him, remember yesterday when you were frustrated and you squeezed your own body and it was great? Oh, that was awesome. So that you remind him, and there might be only a few of those moments to remind him of, But if you remind him when he's on the right track, that leaves breadcrumbs. Oh, okay. Next time I'm frustrated, I'm going to squeeze my own hands. I'm going to stomp my own feet. I'm going to make fists really tight with my hands. That's where my energy is going to go. And then when he's feeling that feeling, the next time he's frustrated and goes to squeeze you, be like, let's squeeze our hands. Because there's a powerful teaching in the moment when he's feeling all those feelings in his body, that that's the moment to give him the muscle memory of what to do. I see. I see. That's actually, that's actually a really good redirection for me too, because in my mind, I, the first place I go is like, oh, I don't want to reject him when he's being too rough with me. I don't want him to feel bad or rejected. However, uh, it's almost like, um, instead of trying to protect him from feeling rejected when he's doing something that is rough and could get him into trouble, teach him how to manage that himself. My challenge I know will be sticking through it uh, and letting him go through the hard, what might be a hard process of learning that. But I like what you said about breadcrumbs. Lay the breadcrumbs. Yes. And there are a few important things in what you just said. One is you don't want him to feel rejected when he's doing something hard. And I love that. And that is a very parental sentiment. However, if he does the same thing to a friend or to another adult, they will drop him like a hot potato. And so while you don't want him to feel rejected, you have decided that that's a horrible thing to ever feel. Yet we're all rejected. And maybe that's just okay. And when we do things that people don't like, shouldn't they be able to tell us so that we can do it differently? Yes. Yes. I, yes. So you don't want him to feel rejected as a human, but you do want that action to be rejected because it doesn't serve him or you. Not, not his experience, right? He's getting, he has energy in his body. He's got to move it. That's not the problem. What he does with it is that's where the challenge is. And we need to teach him to do that differently. So what does he do with his body in that moment? Rather than squeeze you, what can he do that would be acceptable in school to a friend, to another grown up, so that as a entire person, he is accepted with all of his feelings because he knows how to feel overwhelming energy and move it in a way that is safe for everyone involved. Yes. Yes. Like teach him how to through and manage his big impulses, you know, 
I like that a lot. <laughs> it, it's actually something that. Good. The other big thing you said is that it's going to be hard to watch him in the moment have a hard time. And what I want to remind you and anyone who's listening is that an immediate hard moment, we all have them. They make up our lives. But if you can teach Angus that this five minute, three minute, 10 minute, hour long hard moment is going to teach him resiliency to be happy long term, that is worth it. So let him struggle in order to learn the lessons so he can have a beautiful life, so he can have the tools he needs to be in the world. Short term challenge, long term joy. If he doesn't learn how to do hard things now, how will he ever be able to do them later? And life is full of hard things that bring us tremendous satisfaction and accomplishment and pride and joy. But if we're never taught how to do hard things, we'll never get to those big accomplishments. Let him do the hard things. Know that's part of his lesson. It is. And um, by default, I, I really try to protect him from all that for a really long time. And now he's learning them, you know, and it's me learning with him and being able to. And he's like, no, mommy, but I, you know, just kind of being able to be like, I know, son, you can do this. Yeah, you can do hard. We can all do hard things. Do it. I know it's hard. I know it's not comfortable. I know you don't like it. Do it anyway. Go. Mm, I like that for myself. Yes. I have a, a poster of it on my kitchen wall. We can do hard things. Nice. For sure. Because I need the reminder. We all need the reminder, I think. Yep. Yep. All right. So we have covered lots of space, lots of topics and nuances, and it's been awesome. What is the one thing that you're going to make sure you're going to go put in place? The one thing I think that has stuck out the most is doing hard things. The hard thing that comes to mind is the advocacy. Just write the email, say, these are Hi, Camp. This is me. This is who my kid is. These are some things that he struggles with. These are the ways you can help him. And I'm going to read those to myself it was as well to remind myself that I can do those things also do the hard thing of letting him do the hard thing, of letting him experience disappointment that I don't want him to squeeze my face and teach him an alternative so that he can learn to manage his body. So I can do hard things and I can advocate for Angie. And yeah, so it was two things. Sorry, not sorry. You can have to. <laughs> You're good at your job. <laughs> <laughs> Why, thank you. And I love that you have two takeaways. And part of why I do this piece is because after we've talked about so many things, it's so easy to get overwhelmed and try to put everything in place and then feel unsuccessful. And I never want to end time with a parent with them set up to feel unsuccessful. I want you to feel successful as you go back into your family and put these strategies in place. So when you have one or two top of mind and go do it, you're like, oh, I did it. You're not counting the 17 others that you thought you should be doing. You'll put them in place when the time is right. We can't do everything at once. So if you want to take away two, I think that's perfect. One or two is a great place to start. Good. Good. I will. And I will I'll let you know. Amazing. Love that part. So Elizabeth, thank you so much for being here, for sharing so boldly and openly about your family and for being so receptive to possibilities of how to make a difference with your kiddo. Thank you so much for, for having me and listening and uh, helping me out. Anytime. And thank you for listening. I know your time is precious and limited. Grateful that you shared it with me and Elizabeth. And I'm curious, what's your one takeaway action step? Share this in the comments on my website at drmarcy.com. Want to be the first to know when new episodes come out? Go to drmarcy.com backslash podcast and sign up for my mailing list. Want to be a guest on a future episode of Love Your Family again and again and again and again? Go to drmarcy.com backslash podcast guests and let me know. Finally, do you need individualized help with your family? Do you want to have a private session with me or my team virtually or in your home? Yep, I come into your home. Visit drmarcy.com backslash contact and reach out. Remember, blue skies are ahead and we're going to get there together.